okay. It almost sounds like Easter, right? It's awesome. You know, they, they say that in the early church that there wasn't a sermon that was preached where the resurrection wasn't talked about because everything changed at the resurrection. So it's good we begin there. We're in this study that's called Explore God, in which we're looking at the seven most commonly asked questions about faith in God. And we're, we're also doing this in our small groups. And if you're not in one of those groups, every Wednesday night here, we have an open group. That means anybody can come who wants to come. If you tell us you're coming in advance, we'll also have dinner for you. And the idea is really just to explore these questions. And that's the kind of faith we have, one in which Jesus said, you know, seek and you will find. Ask and it will be given. Knock, the door will be opened. And so instead of pushing away or being afraid of our questions, he says, no, bring them. This is how life happens. And so today we're going to look at one of the most difficult, sort of going over the hump of the study, one of the most difficult questions, okay? And all of us have been at the place, the intersection of this question in our hearts. And if you're in that place right now, this is going to really deeply resonate with you. If you'd like to talk with somebody after the service, love to provide that person um, to do that. I'm going to read this text from Romans chapter 5, and I think you'll see why we're looking at this passage together and sort of where the text leads. I'll pray, and then we'll jump in together. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Let's pray together. Lord, you need to open the eyes of our hearts to see this truth that, Lord, only our hearts can comprehend with Jesus. And so, Lord, thank you for being so approachable, being questionable. We can come to you with our questions and for always speaking the truth, not putting us in a dream world, but leading us to the place where we can be honest about our lives. Because we know, Lord, that that's the soil, the only soil out of which hope has a chance to grow. And we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Prisoner 174517 was thirsty. He looked out of his hut in Auschwitz, the concentration camp, and he saw, that's a picture of the camp, he saw a thick icicle that had formed, and, and he could only think of dealing with his thirst, assuaging his thirst. So he reached out through the opening in the building, ready to grab it and to suck on it, when a German officer who was right there just ripped his hand at it, struck the icicle, it fell to the ground and shattered into the dirt in many pieces. The prisoner said, Varum, why? And the guard barked back with brutal power. Here is kein Verum. Here, there is no why. For Primo Levi, that was the prisoner's name, that was the essence of his experience in the death camps. Evil that defies explanation. Lives drained of meaning. <coughs> Darkness there, it made every human explanation weak and empty. There was no why. Thankfully, Levi, <coughs> excuse me, he survived the camp. 
He was one of three Italian Jews out of 650 taken from Italy who returned home. He married, had children, and he wrote books as a witness to the Holocaust. <coughs> Excuse me. He lived a pretty full life, but here's the thing. More than 40 years after his release, he jumped to his death down the steep stairwell at his house. And he did this because there was no why that was strong enough to overcome the darkness he had experienced. Here is kind verum. Here there is no why. Is there a reason why? I mean, how many of us have asked that question ourselves? We've experienced this. I remember asking that question when in 2010 the earthquake hit Haiti. It might not have seemed personal to you, but it was to me. Granada had sent a whole bunch of folks down there to serve, and, and we knew how poor and desperate the situation was there. Why, God? Why of all people this people? Then after meeting the pastors from the Bahamas this past fall, they don't have the resources we have. And looking at them and knowing they'll not, they will not recover from this in their lifetime, most likely. But you know, it's been the personal pain that's hit me the most, maybe for you too. I remember as a young man losing my grandfather so quickly of a heart attack. He's the one who taught me to love the outdoors and how to catch fish. But he was gone in a moment. And the amazing thing was it was the evening before a planned fishing trip. The, the boat had already been pulled out of the garage for an early morning departure. And the bait was already in the cooler with all of the ice. Everything was set to go. And he was gone. And then they're wise of having a critically sick baby at birth and, and knowing there, there's a flaw in his heart. And, and there can be a flaw in the system. Anything is possible. Likely you've had moments like this when you were left, God, what are, you, what are you up to? When life's events unfolded as they did and there seemed to be no logic in it. If you felt this, you're in good company. Even Jesus cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why is this happening? Thank you. Why is this happening? And you know what? There's no record of the Father ever answering you know, I'm, sure as I, I'm not sure as I think about my experience if the answers would have done me any good at those moments of loss. I wasn't ready for an answer. I think I wanted reassurances. I needed support. I wanted to know that my world, the world was secure. There was a purpose to all of it. That our world as broken as it is, is not meaningless. That there is a why. And, and perhaps you felt this. What do you do with that question? Well, first, I think we need to admit our fear of suffering and loss. In our day, we've got the, the feeling that we've tamed life. We have anesthesia. We have things to take away the pain. A few weeks ago, my tooth was being drilled, and I raised my hand to the dentist. Can, can I have some more Novocaine? Novocaine is my friend. Maybe you've had that feeling, too. You see, our answer to pain is technology. We know how to deal with this stuff so we don't have to live with pain anymore. We can take it away. And by the way, we, so, we see no value in it. It's nothing more than an interruption in our lives, the lives we've planned, and, and we plan unhindered health and progress and success. As one writer said, who's helped me a lot, suffering is a scandal. A problem to be conquered rather than a mystery to be understood and a moral challenge to be lived. And that's the strange thing about our scripture passage and why I chose it for today. It's from Paul's letter to the Romans and, and suffering is set in a completely different light. No longer the boogeyman ready to spoil our lives. It comes to serve God's purposes to shape us by developing character in us and hope too. We say, well, how did the transformation happen? And better than that, how can it happen for us? How can we come to view pain and suffering in this light? 
And that's what I want to look at with you today, finding a place for this. And let me tell you from the start, this is not an easy journey, but it's important that we pick up at the beginning of the story. We won't understand it apart from that. You see, when God made the world and everything, he, he pronounced it good. There was no evil. There was no suffering. It was a world empty of pain. But to the first human beings, God laid before them a choice. Would they live in fellowship with him? Would, would life continue in that way? Or would they instead choose to go their own way apart from God? And you know what they chose. We choose it too. We want our choices, our own way in life. And, and we really sort of hardly feel as if we've had a life to live unless we've made that decision for ourselves. But the problem is this. Once made, they couldn't unchoose. Our choice has already been made. And by the way, they wanted the knowledge of good and evil. And, and in the Old Testament language, the word to know is almost the same as the word to experience. And the truth is this, God did not want them to experience evil, but that's not what they chose. God could refuse to allow this, I suppose, but that wouldn't be the truth of it. And the result is a world where there is pain and suffering. The truth is, all of us know this. God is light, in him there is no darkness at all, and so he had to do that which the truth was. And as I think about this, I think, doesn't every parent understand the pain of knowing their child is making the wrong choice, of, of wishing they could do something to prevent it, and that it didn't happen, but knowing it's what it means to live in truth, to live with our choices. Our consequences include our pain and a world with suffering, but this, doesn't this make us lose faith in God? It should cause us to lose faith in humanity. Here's what we're told God did. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. And again, God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what they ought not, what ought not to be done. The words are repeated. He, he gave them over as if to say, well, you want your own way instead of mine? Well, you can actually have it. Now, I can't tell you why your particular suffering or pain has come, but I can tell you that God has given over our world to the kind of life that we've chosen. I can tell you that's how it came into the world. Suffering and pain came into the world as God gave us over to the life we've chosen. Now, don't get me wrong. He doesn't say that we can draw a straight line from every pain to a consequence we deserve. It doesn't work that way. Instead, we brought the flaw into the world, so much so that we're later told that, for the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one that subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. So God placed the whole of creation into step with our choice, and it groans waiting for this day when it'll be set free from all of this. I, I think we know this groaning. But this is why we're where we are. Now, I think all of us understand systems and the way they work. This past year, travel has been subject to delays worldwide, elimination of flights and interruption because of a systems failure in this aircraft, the Boeing 737 MAX. It's been in the news a lot. By the way, it, was a, it is a well-proven flight platform, but because of the failure of the manufacturer to provide appropriate software controls and, and training, a flaw in, was introduced that cost the lives of 346 people to date. 387 of those planes sit on runways or tarmacs somewhere in the world. And when you hear about this, you understand there's a systems failure. Now, you could lose faith in the laws of physics, or in air travel, or in Boeing, 
or in God, or you could say that human beings failed. But you say, well, if God could stop this, why doesn't he stop this? Well, simply he's a God of truth, giving us the very world we asked for. And how difficult must this be for God? Think about that when you understand his character and his nature. I think this is the most difficult thing for our loving God to allow. A few years ago, I, I shared the story of a of an, an, an old guy in Australia who's an evangelist. He goes in public schools. And in Australia, they allow you to make faith presentations. And he would go and hold assemblies and, and tell the students about trusting in God, about faith in Christ. And a part of that was like Explore God, in which he said, if you have a question, write it on a piece of paper. Don't write your name. I don't need to know who you are so that you can put down any question you want. And at the end of the assembly, he would just read the cards and answer the questions. And so one of these assemblies in one of the schools, he got really amazing questions about God and about Christ. And then he took out a card that said this, where was God when I was raped? It's a theological question for sure, but it was more than that. It was a heart cry. And after it was read, big salty tears ro rolled down Smithy, is what they call him, his cheeks, his mustache, and into his beard. And for the longest time, he couldn't speak. The whole group of students fell reverently silent as this grown-up man just cried. He cried over the pain expressed and the desperate question on that card. And you see, he was revealing the heart of God. By the way, if you're one of those places today, likely nothing I say is going to be helpful to you. You may need to just sit and cry. I'd be willing to come and cry with you. Many people have cried with me. But if you begin to understand that, you'll begin to understand the heart of God. You know, Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem when he saw how broken it was and he, he knew their future. He, he wept over the death of a dear friend, even though he's the resurrection and the life. You see, the tears of Jesus reveal the heart and the plan of God. You see, our question about suffering doesn't ultimately lead us to the answer. I hope you'll hear me in this. It leads us to the answerer. It's always been about God and us from the very beginning. And, and that's why that girl's question was, where was God? And that's why our question is, why does God allow? It's always been about God and us. Our question, whatever it is, begins with him. So from the first choice to today, that's what it's about. And God doesn't give us a philosophical answer. Hear me. He sends his living word, Jesus, into the world to answer in his life and death and resurrection. And that's the most incredible event in history. God chose to enter into this. He came to our world in person. Because even God can't wave a magic wand over creation and act like everything is okay. It's not. He joined his story to our story. Think about that. Becoming a human being. Peter Kreef said, God did not varnish over our sin and our suffering. He came into it like a dentist or a surgeon to get it all out. And nobody saw this coming. You could sort of call it God's judo. You know the way that works. You use the enemy's own power to defeat him. Because the Father didn't exempt Jesus from rejection. He wasn't given a free pass from human suffering. Instead, he took the worst. By the way, in those days, it was the cross. That meant to destroy a person in every way, physically and emotionally, socially. He became nothing so that we might know that God loves us and we might be able to live in this love. And all, by the way, of the powers of evil look to have won the day. Suffering and pain seem to have the final word, and Satan and the forces of evil, they laughed huh, with the glee of victory, but in the process they played into the very hand of God. Wow, Jesus came to bear the suffering and pain of the world. You see, God's answer to pain is Jesus. So are you hurting? Let me tell you, Jesus hurt. 
Have you suffered loss? Jesus was there too. Do you weep? Ah, Jesus knows your tears. Are you broken and rejected? This is such familiar territory for Jesus. Has your love been rejected? Has somebody betrayed you? Think of what Jesus went through. And why did he do this? To be God with you and for you. To give us a living hope. You know, when I told you about Primo Levi at the start of the message, I did not tell you that actually many of the survivors of the death camps did what he did. They ended up taking their own lives. They did this because the darkness was so deep they could not escape it. Even getting out of the prison was not escape from that. It cast a shadow over everything. They're suffering and pain. And by the way, ours can do that too. It can cast a shadow over everything in your life. But you know, there were two women in another camp, Corey and Betsy Tenboom. You'll see a picture of them. They were Christians who were taken to the camps because their Dutch family, at the height of when Jews were being taken and, and sent away to the camps, decided they would ha harbor them in their home. And the amazing thing is when the authorities came to arrest them and the members of their family, they were harboring, I think, five or six Jews in their home. They were discovered and the Jews in hiding were not. Corey and her sister went off to the same camp, and sadly, Corey had to suffer the death of her sister. She did not survive. This was devastating to Corey, but listen to this. Betsy's last words before she died were this. There is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. That's the gospel. Do you know that God used the very thing that stands against us, suffering and pain, to fulfill his purposes in our world? Jesus didn't run from it. He, he descended into it. He carried it. He lived it so that you might have peace with God. Listen to that verse. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the peace we had in the beginning. When we come to faith and we trust in him, that which used to separate us now comes to serve God's purposes for our salvation. And, and that's the shocking thing. The very thing that stood against us becomes the source of life for us. And this explains passages that sound absolutely shocking. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, we read. Or elsewhere, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Really? You're supposed to count it joy? Now, he's not saying don't be happy that you're hurting. He's saying rejoice that even the pain and suffering in your life are going to be used by God for your good. God is for us. And even there, God is at work. And that, that's the gospel that the God uses the very thing that stood against us for our good. The worst that could happen to Jesus brought about life that we now enjoy and the peace that we can live in. Suffering is a mystery, but it's also an opportunity to trust in God and not in ourselves, to live with hope when our redemption has not been fully applied in our lives. It's, it's coming, and we groan with the creation for that to develop character and understand the gospel that we are loved by God. Listen to Paul again. Knowing that your suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Some years ago, I first read the story of Bob Wieland. I don't know if you've heard of Bob. He first ran the New York C City Marathon. He finished in 19,413th place. Yeah, it was totally last. The last person to finish the race. And actually, Bob's marathon time at the time was the slowest in history. It took him four days, two hours, 48 minutes, and 17 seconds. I thought, I could even beat him. Come on. However, he was greeted as a hero. The press was out. The race director was there. And you say, why is that? 
Well, he is the first man to ever run a marathon with his arms instead of his legs. You see, he was a 40-year-old Californian whose legs were blown off in the Vietnam battlefield 17 years before the race. When he finished, he repeatedly just bumped, pumped his arms. Woo! He claimed his finisher's medal. They had it for them. Then he explained why he did it. He said, success is not based on where you start. It's based on where you finish. And I finished. The joy has been the journey. And an amazing journey it's been. Since then, do you know, Bob crossed the entire continent of the United States only on his arms. Took him three years, eight months, and six days to travel from coast to coast. And his truth, his injury, created deep character in him. Here's what he said when the tragedy happened. He said, my legs went one way and my life went another way. I mean, come on. And when you think about that, you think, you know, how might God use the brokenness in our lives? And that's why this passage is radical. It says the thing we most fear the most, the thing we run from, God, because we have peace with him, we know that he is not coming to us over our sin. This isn't what this is about. This all fell on Jesus, that because of that, he is determined to use this for your glory, for your salvation, to develop your character He said, through him, Jesus, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. In other words, we know what's coming. We we know what the end of the race is. And it's going to be long. I I promise that. It will be hard. But you're going to reach it in Christ. So what if you realized your suffering, your struggles were not punishment for what you've done in your life? Because Jesus took that. And now you live with the hope of the glory of God in your life, in the midst of the pain for sure. Every day you're learning your need of God and his grace. You're depending on his sufficiency. You're learning to trust him and to persevere, using suffering not as a justification that there is no God, but as a force pushing you to trust him and look to him even more every day and seeing that Jesus has already joined you in the journey. Lord, we would love for you to just wave your hand and remove all the pain and difficulty. But Lord, that wouldn't be the truth of the needs of our world. And we know that you're a God of truth. You're a God who is light. In you, there is no darkness at all. And maybe that's the thing, Lord. We can't live with the truth of how needy our world is and how needy we are. So needy that God had to come in person and bear the pain and suffering himself that we might know life. But because he has, Father, we know that your, your look toward us is only love. Your goal in us is only life. And so, Lord, from the places where we're hurting, help us to see that. Not because we've heard the right answers, but because we met Jesus. And, Lord, in all of that, we praise you for what you have planned And we do join with the rest of the creation, just groaning for the fulfillment of all of your promises in in Jesus. Lord, bring that day. Cause that day to come. Father, we thank you there is a reason why. And we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. About two weeks.